Um, okay, so I am recording now. So hi, everyone. Um, people are going to probably start to continue to um, join in in the next few minutes, but we do want to get started. Um, so there's enough time for Mark's presentation and uh, questions and discussion afterwards. Um, I will, I will just a couple housekeeping. Um, if you can put your microphones on mute during the presentation so we don't have any background noise and we can all hear, hear Mark clearly uh, and then um, just unmute yourself if you have a question. I am recording this. So if you um, uh, don't want your face on the screen, um, there you go. So now we just have Mark. Um, and so I am recording this and we will make it available. There were um, quite a lot of people that did register uh, for the presentation, some whom I know want, wanted to attend but couldn't, so registered so we could send them the recording. Um, and for those of you who don't uh, know me, my name is Kathy. I'm with Pause for Hope Animal Foundation. We are located in British Columbia, Canada. And uh, very excited to have Mark here to talk about um, open, more open and embraceive adoption policies. Uh, we at Pause for Hope are really um, committed to uh, removing barriers and access to pet guardianship and uh, caring and keeping your pets. So I, I think I may have lost Mark. I'm still here. I can see oh, you. you so. oh, oh, yeah. weird. Okay. So, okay. Uh, you just disappeared there for a minute. Great. So, Mark, I am going to uh, pass it over to you. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Hey, everybody. Uh, as Kathy said, my name is Mark Peralta. I work for Best Friends Animal Society. Um, I am uh, headquartered, actually, myself in New England, um, but I work all over the United States, mostly in places that have the highest volume of animals still at risk in the U.S., so it's really nice to be here. Um, my only regret is that I'm actually not in British Columbia um, currently right now, but um, what I'm going to say is to hopefully get Kathy to bring me to British Columbia again is we're really gonna go over kind of, you know, we have an hour and I don't wanna talk at you for an hour. I wanna talk, I wanna go through, I wanna set some, some uh, I wanna set the table a little bit. I wanna talk about kind of found out foundational adoption policies um, and kind of some really big key things to enter in. But usually this is a series of a workshop um, where we actually dig in into, uh, independently with different organizations because it's not a one size fits all adoptions. And adoptions isn't obviously a um, super innovative new talk when it comes to animal welfare. The, the thing that I would point out though is adoptions are still one of the most essential life-saving operation and doing them effectively to be more inclusive, to get what we need to save more lives is always a challenge. And it's often almost always in any shelter that I go and work in, um, one of the things that we need to do quite a bit of work on, and even in the shelters that I've overseen or that I've been a part of inside of Best Friends or in my shelter past, it's something that has a continual follow-up on because it's easy for us in animal welfare um, to kind of slip into old habits, especially when it comes to protecting our pets um, and making sure that they're going to what we think are our proper homes. And so we're going to kind of get into all of that um, and, and kind of, you know, just the best guideline. And then we're going to have some time to, to answer questions for anybody that has questions. And feel free if you want to put questions in the chat, because I can certainly look at those um, when we're done. Um, Kathy will probably help me kind of keep an eye on those as well, so we can make sure um, that we get to everything. So you don't forget your questions as we're going through, but we'll definitely have a Q&A portion at the end. And just to kind of give you um, a run of the mill of today's talk, uh, table of contents, so to speak, is um, I think it's important and you might kind of, you know, why are we talking about pet markets and trends? I think it's going to be important for all of us to kind of set, again, I need to set the table a little bit, you know, what is the population percentage of people that, that are adopting, both in the U.S. and even in some, uh, some stats for Canada? Um, implicit bias is an important part of, of talking through um, you know, how to do barrier free adoptions, um, getting to that point of what is a barrier versus what is a good practice and how do I balance those um, conversation based counseling and then obviously some foundational tips to end this out. 
All right. So this is one of the busiest slides that I've ever had and presented, but you guys can uh, all look at these on your own. But what this really is in, in a nutshell is kind of a survey that we do at Best Friends. And we do this kind of often because it's really important for us to understand what is the percentage of people that are getting new pets, adopting, like, and there's all kinds of demographics from age to gender to income that's that you can see um, on the right side of the screen there. But what I kind of want to point out just really briefly is that Self-identifying, and this 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 uh, survey is really about people that are not attached to animal welfare, but that are pet owners um, or potential pet owners, and where they think are going to look to get their pets. So, 36% of of people acquiring new pets are identifying as adopting them. Now, the important thing is 6% of those say they got them at a store, and I think all of us that have been in animal welfare long enough know that if they got it at a Petco or a PetSmart, they are adopting. But if they're getting it at a store. Um, that potentially is a puppy mill, they use the words adoption and rescue and those kind of things. So just understand it's not a perfect science, but it's just good to point out. And with cats, 43% were uh, of the of the section um, said that they adopted cats. So um, we have a growing number in the market. Um, obviously, that's not even half of kind of the new pet market, but there's, you know, a multitude of reasons for that. Um, but kind of in this, you can kind of see, um, and this came from um, Pots for Hope, is I wanted to kind of get a, a really kind of quick and dirty and Kathy and her team were able to put this together and just kind of see what does it look like in Canada. Um, so this is, you know, the first slide that I was showing you is the United States, this is Canada. And you're seeing that, you know, they're self-identifying at almost 55% of um, pet acquisition coming from a shelter or rescue. I would be willing to bet in certain provinces and areas too, I'm sure your puppy mill folks love to use the rescue language as well. So um, just something good to kind of keep in mind with this, but I thank you, Kathy, and to your team for helping get some, um, a little bit of perspective for our Canadian attendees as well. In this slide, it's really about, and then probably not surprising to anybody, um, household growth and then the pet household growths are all increasing. And I think the most important thing, um, and again, you'll have this slide to dig into on your own, but you know, um, pet household growth are actually outpacing the overall household growth in the United States. So again, you're looking in more and more homes and more and more adopters um, are looking for pets um, as a part of their family. And in our study, it was really important that we kind of identified what kind of came out of this is we identified in the survey that there's kind of two different kind of, for lack of a better term for this presentation, mostly consumers, people that are looking to get new pets. Um, and you have those consumers that are looking to adopt, they're looking to rescue, um, they want to, to utilize kind of what we do, right? And then you have a subset of the population who are looking as, we're, we're identifying as purchasers. And I think on this slide, you can kind of see that obviously purchasers are the individuals that are most kind of digging into, especially when it comes to dogs. They love a breed, right? Like I've grown up with King Charles Spaniels, you, you know, my entire life, I only adopt King Charles Spaniels. We definitely definitely have that in the rescue world. But you can see even it doesn't matter if people are identifying as adopters and people looking for rescue or people that are looking to purchase pets, far more of them are looking at characteristics. How are they going to fit in my family? Um, what do I know about this animal versus kind of breed? You can see for adopters, breeds generally fall to 7%. It doesn't mean that people don't come into your you know, organization or, or contact you and say, hey, I'm looking for a pug. The thing with adopters is they tend to be a lot more, have a lot more of an ability to kind of talk through a characteristic of what we're looking for and still adopt an animal, even if we don't have their pug um, that they're looking for. And this is kind of what we're going to dig into, because this is important information when we talk about foundational adoptions, is what is the motivation of these people? Like what overall are the things that are most important to them to get them to select rescue or adoption, um, or, you know, even understanding with purchasers what, what is most important to them? And, you know, desire to rescue an animal. So people that are reaching out to us, by and large, are buying into our message about saving lives and rescuing and finding these animals that don't have anyone a new home. Um, there is low cost, you know, pets are a long-term commitment. It costs money to continue with pets. So they're looking sometimes not to be 
um, presented with a big bill to begin with, like a, a big adoption fee, those kind of things. Um, very interested in the vaccine, spay and neuter information, and obviously the things that go into um, kind of fit and, you know, are they friendly? You know, how are they, you know, and, and you know, how, are, how am I going to be treated by going in um, to adopt by a rescue or a shelter? Are, are people knowledgeable? Can they tell me anything? And sometimes that's really hard for us, right? Like we take animals sometimes directly from the streets, even the shelter maybe only holds them for five days if you're a rescue and you're getting it. So, you know, a lot of times we have to give them information that we know, and we certainly don't have an ancestry tree um, for all of our shelter pets, which I think a lot of our, our um, potential adopters would like. So, um, but this is really about the people who we're looking to take our pets. You know, they're looking for um, cost effectiveness. They're looking to save lives. They're looking for people to treat them with respect. They're looking to make sure that, you know, the basic necessities of the animal uh, potentially are handled, vaccine, spay, neuter, those kind of things. So I kind of answered this, uh, you know, I kind of blew the lead here because I, I said it in the beginning, but why is it important that about, you know, 30 or, you know, I guess now 40%, uh, at least in the US are adopting from a shelter and rescue. It's because we wanna maximize that market. Um, I don't think we should ever say, we want 100% of the pet market. I don't know that there's that many animals that, that are there to, for us to get 100%. And there is a subset of people that are looking for only puppies, only young dogs, only small dogs. And often they fall more in the purchaser category than they do in the rescuer category. But it's good to know that you have an increase of people that are looking to acquire pets, no matter if they're purchaser or adopter. We have information as to what they're looking for to help them make that decision. And that's kind of where we start with kind of the foundations of building a really good uh, pet adoption uh, foundation. So really quick, this is from 24 Hour Pet Watch. And the thing that, that I wanna kind of talk about before we get into um, adoption policies is kind of trends. Obviously 2020 was a really crazy strange year when it came to how many animals were entering shelters, um, what was going on. Um, in large part, shelters were closed for months on end um, at times, certainly limiting um, their intakes. I think in some aspects that is a good thing because more of the community was able to step up and help because not every animal that enters a shelter potentially needs to go in there, especially when we talk about community cats or those kind of things. And, and it really forced some shelters into rethinking, you know, how they're acquiring pets or whether or not we can trust the community a little bit here or there. But that being said, the shelter is a very important place to fall back on and be there for pets that have nowhere else. And, and what we're trying to do is figure out how we make sure that those shelters can maximize their ability to take in the amount of pets that they can properly care for and get the ones um, which are the far majority out to homes or rescues or wherever um, that deserve to be alive. And the thing that's that I just wanna point out on here um, is you're seeing intake, not surprising, in 2021, starting to rise as of February, but specifically in March and April. And the adoption rates um, are not rising to the same level of intake. So it's really early in the year. We're obviously only in May, but that is one of the things that I'm more alarmed about than kind of some of the stories that are coming out about returns being out of control or, or the COVID boom pets that are now getting surrendered. The fact of the matter is when, when they're talking to a shelter that's trying to compare this April to last April, many of those shelters were closed. So we try to look, and you'll see a slide next on this, um, about you know what are they trending, trending in, in 2019, which was more of a year that we didn't have closures and those kind of things due to the pandemic. So adoptions are really important. And right now we are not, the trajectory of how we're handling the amount of adoptions to the amount of intakes coming in shelters are not working in our favor. So again, this is a comparison and, and what we want people to see for the full picture, because many of you have maybe have heard or seen some of these news stories where it's like, you know, people are, you know, the boom and everybody's going back to work and they're, they're dropping their animals back at the shelter. The fact of the matter is, is in comparison to 2019, which was more of a traditional shelter year, just like in traditional meaning that shelters are open and periodically operating um, somewhat in the same kind of manner or, or hours that they were before. And you're seeing that, you know, intake is still not coming to the level it was in 2019. So it's continuing to decrease, um, you know, adoptions, all of that kind of stuff. So it's just important to know that even with euthanasia, 
um, while suppressing last year's in April being more, you have to understand, especially in the United States, many, many shelters last year were closed. So yeah, they're going to have lowered <laughs> euthanasia numbers because many of them were not taking animals in at all. Um, so it's, but it's remaining significantly lower than 2019. So just something to kind of keep an eye on and try to put some context to um, in some of these kind of stories that are out there. And this is a 2019 to 2020, 24 hour pet watch trend that I got in regards to Canada. So um, they took, you know, about 56 Canadian shelters uh, that were data sourced through um, pet health. And you're seeing kind of the same story as the US intake and adoptions, um, you know, being significantly down uh, compared to 2019 as well. And in 2021, which you can't see on this graph, Canada's trends in regards to intake starting to rise um, hasn't kept up with the US. You guys are still in many parts in lockdown, the borders closed and a lot of Canadian um, groups definitely are transporting um, from outside of the country oftentimes. So we do think, and 24 hour pet watch thinks more importantly, that this trend probably will open up and we'll, it'll be interesting to see as we get more animals back into shelters, how are, how are those kind of open, uh, excuse me, adoption or, or live intake trends you know, going with them. All right, so let's get into the adoption stuff. So this sometimes, and, and I think in the world that we live in now, you're hearing a lot more about this, but a lot of uh, adoption talks that I've done for 15 years, there's always ways around trying to help people understand implicit bias. I think there's a better understanding uh, culturally about this as, as there ever has been, um, but it tends to be kind of a touchy issue for people. But the fact of the matter is, is we all have implicit bias. It doesn't make us a bad people. It doesn't make us bad people, but it, it does show us at times that we tend as human beings to make judgment on things. Often it's because it's a person that we don't really understand. Um, you may have had a bad experience with a certain, you know, individual and there's a generalization kind of theory that comes with that. And implicit bias is a big thing in when it comes to adoptions and animal welfare. I mean, so I was talking and, and there's a gentleman that's on the call, um, Rob Rosas from North Philadelphia. I grew up mostly in Southern United States. So the Southern United States, much more rural, <laughs> we're very polite. Um, and my first, um, I don't know month in Philadelphia was kind of an eye opener. I kind of loved it, but it also kind of scared me because um, people are a lot more loud. They're brash. They're going to tell you how they feel. That kind of Southern politeness and, and that kind of stuff goes out the window. Um, and for me, it was kind of, I had to kind of recheck my cultural kind of, um, you, you know, it was just kind of a culture shock. Um, and I think if, you know, I could see one of these wonderful individuals that I'm working with going in loud, brash, you know, um, hand gestures all over the place, talking about they wanted an animal from North Philadelphia into one of my shelters that I started out with in Colorado, or even where I lived in Arkansas or Georgia, um, there would be definitely implicit bias because a lot of that is just so unknown to people. They'd, oh, this person's loud. Why are they yelling at me? If they're going to yell at me, they're going to yell at their dog. And it, it's, it's just, you know, sometimes taking a little bit of a step back and understanding you know, the different cultures, different way people are. And sometimes it has nothing to do with race. Sometimes it has to do with region. It has to do with kind of community. Um, it's just, you know, very different. I would suspect, um, you know, without knowing as much about Canada, you know, you definitely have all kinds of stuff from different kind of people. And the thing that's important about implicit bias is it's not to the front of your head. Explicit bias is when you have that partner of yours. Like I've had rescues tell me, I only adopt to people that are just like me. That's not implicit bias. That's explicit bias. They're aware of it. They're actively searching out a very specific individual and, and they are setting a bias against anybody that's not like me. And I think it's important for us to understand when somebody comes in, you know, that's younger and I'll have a story to kind of back this up um, that looks nothing like you. Um, talks different from you, inflections completely different. Um, if you're feeling uncomfortable or you're starting to think you're getting that gut feeling that this person isn't the best pet owner, I think it's important to hopefully come back and say, is it just because this is somebody that's so different from me that I'm having um, a hard time connecting or understanding where this person's coming from? I think explicit bias is something that's a little bit harder to work through. Obviously, you're, you know, upfront understanding, like, I don't adopt to this person. I don't adopt to students. 
all of them. They won't keep their animals. They're going to move on. They're going to get their job. You know, that's kind of the stuff where you see explicit bias happening in, in adoption uh, policies, which you have 55 year old students, you have 18 year old students. They're not all the same. They're all in the same, you know, category or same place in life. So this is what I looked like the first time I ever had to buy a suit. I look like I'm, I think I look like I'm 12 years old, but I'm actually 18 years old in this picture, if you can believe that. Um, and I think a good way to kind of, you know, bring this up in kind of a quick personal story that I'm not going to extend out is, you know, the first time I took a managerial job, I was 18 years old. I was working at a Marriott, but in the restaurant and I got promoted to be a supervisor, super excited. And I remember it was right after the beginning of the year. So I just done my taxes from the year before and I had like $800 coming back to me in taxes, which was huge. And I was a supervisor and supervisors wear suits. I had never worn a suit in my entire life. Um, I was living in a two bedroom house with five people, like, you know, pretty poor, like it just suits weren't a part of the, the common um, wardrobe at that time. So I remember going out and, and here's the thing that I think we need to remember about people that are going to the rescue for the first time or to a shelter for the first time. I knew I needed a suit. I had no idea how to match suits. I had no idea what my suit size was. And like a lot of people, I didn't, I was too bullheaded when I was young to actually be confident enough to ask the real questions. So I remember walking into the first store and, and looking around and that one was really bad. Cause as soon as I walked in, one of the uh, sales attendants just started following me around. And that made me know, like, I think they think I'm, I'm trying to steal something. It's like, what is this guy you're looking at? And the thing that you're not seeing is at the time I had that little, like, I thought I was growing a mustache goatee, but it was like really thin. Um, you know, so just, it, I just looked ridiculous. I looked like an 18 year old punk and that's how I was treated. Um, so this guy in his baggy clothes is in this kind of nice, you know, place to get a suit. Um, and basically the first thing that came to mind is this guy's here to steal. So I leave, don't talk to anybody the entire time, go to another place. This is the same mall, um, walk in the other place and they kind of look me up and down. They didn't follow me, but didn't talk to me at all. Like, this guy's not worth my time, this little punk, you know, whatever, whatever. Walk around. I'm trying to figure out, but I have no idea what to do. Um, walk out of the next door. Third store I walk into, I go in, and luckily, lovely lady, she kind of goes in. And for some reason, she starts to ask me, hey, what are you doing? What are you uh, kind of in for? And I was very insecure at this time. I had two really bad experiences. And I said, oh, um, you know, I, I need a suit for uh, a wedding. And I, and I just lied. I don't know why I lied, but I did. But I was feeling insecure. And she goes, oh, OK, so she's showing me these kind of very formal suits. And she goes, I'll help you out. And this, this and that. And as she's talking to me, I think she figured out, like, are you really going to a wedding? Like, why? Why? Just tell me what you're doing here. But she's catching me in a lie because I'm telling her things that I think will be more appropriate for her to hear to ultimately get to what I need. And long story short, she sorted through my bull crap, figured out what I wanted, was extremely kind, got me, you know, hooked up in the suit that you see now which maybe not the best pick but I loved it at the time and uh, I shopped for suits at that same store for the next 20 years and I think the thing that's important is and that will equate to animal welfare in this is sometimes people look different I've had to talk to adoption counselors and said how am I going to adopt to this guy who doesn't have teeth and I'm like I, I just don't understand what teeth and, you know, I guess personal welfare. Have you talked to the guy? Like, is there anything else? Like, look at him, you know, he looks like he's homeless. I, you know, fair and fair enough. I mean, uh, I I've been in that kind of same situation where, you know, people have taken a quick look at me and made kind of assumptions that are, or may or may not be true. And the fact of the matter is, is assumptions um, on age. So we have a lot of that too. There's a lot of rescues, at least in the States that I work with. They don't want to adopt to anybody that's under 25, like just like insurance company, all of a sudden 24 year olds and 25 year olds, there's just something magic that happens in that one year. Um, you know, with me, people going to criminal intent, my first time, not in Rob's area, I have to admit. So Rob Rose is on the call. He worked with me in Philadelphia. His shelter was pretty on point with this kind of stuff because they had done animal control. They were seeing animals come and go. But I have to say, I worked in another facility that was five blocks away that was also a part of the same shelter structure at the time. 
And my first week there, my adoption counselors thought their goal was to catch people and lie and refuse adoptions to them. So that was something. So everybody came in with criminal intent. You know what I mean? Whether it was not maybe just to steal an animal, but it was always like my job is to cut through the crap and find out because I know these people are not good people. And it was and they would high five each other. I'm not even kidding. When, yep, I, I got to this interview. This person said this. I caught him in the lie and I told him to get out of here. And I was like, well, you know, we've got our work cut out for you. Um, people are anxious, right? Like they, they love an animal. Doesn't mean that they have to be animal experts all the time to get an animal. And sometimes that cuts people in kind of the situation that I described in the suit. Like sometimes people, and we'll get into this more, they're, they think they're, they're giving you information based on what you want to hear versus the truth. And we're going to talk about how you cut through that because all we all want is to understand what people's kind of situations are so we can be, be, best meet their expectations for animals. So, and it's really about, you know, finding the right answer so we can do a good job of, of getting somebody um, a new pet or sometimes finding them a different situation because you don't have a pet that's, that's going to work. So in that same survey that had some of those numbers earlier, these were kind of the, e, the biggest call outs around personer, uh, purchaser, excuse me, and adopters. Uh, but mostly we focused obviously on the adopters here as to what are the things that have been challenging or specifically in their subset of purchasers, there were people that said, well, I wanted to rescue, but I had to purchase. And that was really interesting to us. And we were like, well, why? And there was a big subset of, of the purchasers that actually wanted to start out as adopters. Um, and it was these things, you know, um, I wanted to spend more time with the animal in a private area. So that's why a lot of shelters and rescues are turning to sleepovers and those kind of things. So somebody's not kind of put under the gun, you know, I know you met this dog for 15 minutes, make your decision. You know what I mean? Like it, it kind of gives people a little bit more ease, um, you know, uh, more info. And, and this is tricky because most of us hopefully know you can't really checklist behavior on an animal in a 15 minute um, evaluation. That's a very dangerous and unfair thing. Animals aren't, you know, aware that they're performing for their lives or performing for an adoption in those time frames. But getting information and being able to, to, you know, whether it's through, you know, your fosters, whether it's through volunteers, your staff of things that they're starting to notice about the animal, so we can let them know this is kind of what we're seeing, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and you know, a medical checklist. You know, it's really important for people. Again, are they vaccinated? Do they have a microchip? Are they spayed and neutered? Those kind of things. Um, this is a big one. People are excited. People want convenience, right or wrong or indifferent. People want to get that animal the same day. So I don't want to go. I don't want to select this animal. I don't want to say, "Yep, that's the one," and, I, and then wait two weeks to get my animal. So that is a barrier, better or worse. It just is. Um, and you can kind of see making sure that people can go through and more and more in these days, people want to search. They want to see the animals that are in your population first and foremost and do their homework um, more so than not. So searchable database can be anything from you pinning, you know, your available animals if you're a rescue on Facebook at the very top and then unpin them when they're adopted or it's having a website or using if you have software using um, pet tango or pet finder or any of that stuff that can make it easy for people um, and trial adoptions as we kind of talked about before are are a big kind of step forward in, in client service so um, this kind of goes over the same thing and i want to dig in for this presentation into a couple of these in particularly so cost very much um, in our field, if somebody can't afford an animal, they shouldn't have one. And so if they can't pay that initial uh, adoption cost, then they're not going to be able to care for this animal. That is something that it, it's, it, it's a very well-known kind of thing I hear all the time to this day. I actually heard somebody say it to me yesterday um, in a Zoom call with a shelter. And while I understand that kind of sentiment, the fact of the matter is, is people are going to get pets. Um, and it doesn't mean that you should just adopt to anybody and everybody, but if you have a prohibitive adoption fee because you are trying to use adoption fees to support your rescue, um, it is just going to be a barrier. It's just, it just is because people know that there's long-term costs to animals. And if there is an ability or a way for us to, in animal welfare, to grow things like, you know, Facebook campaigns and those kind of things. And I'll talk to you about some of the stuff that I do. I actually run a rescue on top of working at Best Friends. I have zero adoption fees and I'll explain to you why, but it is, it's something to be aware of. And I think the thing that 
you can be smart about this. It doesn't mean that you don't have adoption fees or you always have low adoption fees, but if you're saving lives, certain animals, um, you know, in certain times of the year where you're getting, your shelters are getting overflowed because it's kitten season or there's more dogs coming in over the summer or whatever's happening, adoption promotions and fee waived adoptions are an important tool. I mean, they're as old as, as, as I am in animal welfare, but the thing is, is there's still a lot of people that really struggle with, I can't give away a free animal because they're going to go to the worst people. There is no statistical data and it's actually on the, on the other end that adoption fees mean better homes. That It's just not, there's no data that supports that. It's just one of those things that perpetuates in animal welfare because it seems like it makes sense. And it's counterintuitive to the fact that some people just want to, it's, you know, sometimes when there is a promotion or a deal or something like that, they've been waiting for a while. They know that they want an animal. This is the time I'm going to that rescue or that shelter. And I'm going to give you all a little bit more information um, at the end of this that you guys can read about this a little bit more if this is something that's really hard for you to wrap your head around. Uh, and that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. It's, it's not, it's something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, but this is a good one right right off from Emily Weiss from the SPCA and Shannon Graham um, that kind of talks about those attachment levels of adopters of cats in particular and fee-based adoptions and what that works. Some of the stuff that I'm kind of, you know, really quickly going over. And Vintage Pet Rescue is a rescue that my wife and I um, run here in Rhode Island. And Rhode Island, like many parts of Canada, are in areas where there isn't an overflux of animals in shelters. We do, you know, a lot of shelters around here do a lot of transports. Um, but one of my personal passions since I've started in animal welfare was seeing older animals not quite ready to be gone, but that are starting to decline. Um, families having to give them up for whatever reason, and then their last days are in a shelter. That's why I started this rescue. My wife and I were very, um, you know, in line with that. So the thing that we know is we deal with, I mean, if it, we get a 10 year old dog, that is, that is young for us. We generally get to the geriatric level animals for the most part. And we're not a huge rescue, um, but we take on a lot of dogs that need a ton of medical support. Like we have astronomical cost per animal because we um, have a facility that my wife and I live in um, which, you know, we only live in this place because we have this rescue, um, a lot of medical, you know, certain animals, I'm not kidding, we'll put 15 or $20,000 in, they need MRIs, they need spinal surgery, but it will prolong their life for years, those kind of things that we do, but we don't have adoption fees. And the reason being is, is when we want to adopt, you know, these are elderly animals, like they're going to take, um, a lot of care ongoing that we, you know, don't want to, you know, put as a barrier in front of people because we already have a smaller subset of people that want to take not just old dogs, not six year old dogs, 14 year old dogs, 15 year old dogs. And all we really do for us is do a lot of fun promotions on Facebook. We try to keep very positive stories, get people to learn about who our dogs are. A lot of people know them by name. Um, sometimes we do goofy stuff like, you know, for separation anxiety, um, there is a dummy that replaces me when I go on the road for work that comforts some of our dogs. His name is Fark. Um, those kind of things. And just try to have a lot of fun, but really try to get people aware that, you know, sometimes it's really cool. Older dogs are so much easier for me. They're lazy, just like me. They like to sit on the couch, watch Netflix. Those are my kind of dogs. Puppies don't have the energy, don't have the time. Um, so it's kind of giving people different perspective, but we don't use adoption uh, fees and, and low fees would probably be fine, but they are an adoption barrier for us, even though our cost per animal, you know, we spend about $215,000 a year um, on our dogs. We take in about 80, I think last year. So just do the math. I mean, that's an astronomical number. Uh, it's like $2,000 per, per dog, but that's what we're doing. And we're here because this is a, a, a gap in our community here in, in New England and in New York and Philadelphia actually, where we rescue that we can kind of help. Um, so, and this is a, a good kind of part of our brand study uh, that we did. It's another, uh, we being best friends, and it kind of gets in, and this kind of gets into some implicit bias and some of the things that we um, kind of talk about. But in this study and kind of getting into kind of information about um, kind of different levels of income in particular um, and why people want pets, the things that we are finding, um, and this has been in studies going back to the 90s. Carter Luke did a study that, that had some of this information, and I think in 1998, but there is a lower income family 
data background that have a great depth of bond with pets, no less of a depth of bond with people that have more means. Um, the role and purpose of your rescue, I think, is what's important. Like, are you a rescue in the fact that you just want to find animals, take them from low income communities and find the richest people to place those dogs? Is that really serving a need? Like, especially in the year that we just had, I think we can all understand over anybody, it doesn't matter who you are, how many pets have actually helped us through this hellish year, um, along with everything else that's going on. And can you imagine if you're worried about, um, you know, just everything that's going on and having a pandemic on top of it, and there is no evidence that the amount of money that you make equates to better love. Sure. Do they have more means? Um, but, I, you know, I was I had four dogs when I was making, you know, 850 an hour as the kennel attendant. When I started in this field, I would have done anything. I would have tried to figure things out. I didn't have a rich uncle that I could lean on. Um, and a lot of people get very resourceful or even better, us in the rescue community creating, um, you know, pet access health and pet accessibility for helping people like that, because pets are such an important part of mental health for people. And I know that that's still not as understood, but for us in animal welfare, we know this and we know, and we have an ability as our purpose in rescue to not only save these pets, but also diversify the, the people that we're willing to help. Because if they have us as a support system, it's so much better than if they become a purchaser and they have to then still go find $500, buy an animal from a pet store or an online sale, and then they have no one. So maybe it's not really about us anointing somebody as worthy at the start point of adoption, but being able to kind of grow that relationship with them and have that support system where they can fall back on us as a rescue or a shelter to be able to support and give them those kind of resources. That is more of a community ethic. It's in, instead of it just being, you know, kind of a, a business where we're kind of excluding a large portion of our community that also love pets. So that's what I mean by do you want clients or do you want customers? Clients are usually a term that we kind of equate more to our longer term relationships. And I hope most of us in rescue and in shelters want clients. We want them to continue to support us through donations, stay connected, and certainly look to us when they have life changes, they get a divorce, a new baby, those kind of things. We want them to be able to reach back to us. And it's all about how we kind of approach that initial adoption process with them. Um, so why don't we kind of move forward here and get into kind of the application. So a lot of the subset of the purchasers that wanted to be in the adoption subset said that they got rejected. And oftentimes they got rejected for things that the, the three things that they got rejected for most, probably not surprising is yard type, <laughs> how hours worked and type of home. Do you live in a house with a yard? Do you live in an apartment? Oh, you live in an apartment. You can't have this animal. Oh, you don't have a yard or you don't have a fence that's this tall. There's this kind of worst case scenario. If you're not um, a good pet owner, we can't, we can't, you know, do that. And then getting into the kind of strict rules and requirements. So we're going to dig into this a little bit. So I think when it comes to yards, you know, the things like yard types, hours worked, what are we actually trying to get at? And most of the time, what we're trying to do is prevent a bad thing from happening. And that's coming from a good place. We don't want our animals to be put in risk, right? We don't want you know, the minute we adopt an animal, you know, somebody is, you know, the animal's running out because their fence isn't long enough, they jump a fence and they get lost or, or even worse. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, you saw those trends and how many pet owners there are. Because we're in a field that we rescue animals, we often see, because of what we do, um, some of the worst case scenarios of things that happen in our population. And I think what we lose grip of is the fact that it's usually generally a very small percent of actually pet owners who actually have no problem, even though they're not having access to people like us. So also when you do the worst case scenarios and saying, okay, this dog went to a yard, it jumped the fence, it got hurt. I am from now on every one of my adoption, um, you know, my adoption rules are going to be, they have to have a six foot fence. That's how a lot of this kind of stuff happens. And so now there's this huge population of pet lovers and pet people. If they don't have a six foot fence, they're not the same kind of person. You're now going to automatically exclude them from being an adoption partner. And I think that is, it may make it simple for you, but it's not being inclusive. It's not probably in the best interest of the majority of your animals because many animals, I mean, I have to admit to myself when I was in an apartment in Los Angeles, I walked my dogs three times a day for a long time, took them out. 
I walk my dogs twice a week, maybe now in my big yard. And even when I put them in the yard, they usually sit by the door unless I'm out there. So it's not like they're getting great exercise. So yeah, are they safe if I put them outside? Sure. Does it make me a better pet owner now because I have a house? Not so much. And I think those are the kind of things that we need to think through um, when we're putting these kind of really black and white policies on, you know, do you live in an apartment? Do you not? you know, whether or not this animal is going to be good for an apartment or not. And I get it. There's things like barking. Um, and if you live in an apartment, that might be an issue. And I think you need to talk through and, and, you know, kind of what are you going to do if, you know, this dog's home alone and it's barking all the time, you're going to get complaints. Maybe there's another dog that you can kind of try to work with them on that might be a better fit by just excluding everybody that's in an apartment based on kind of a black and white rule is limiting the amount of people that can actually help your animals. And I get it. If you're a rescue, my animals are safe. They're not at risk, but that's not the same for other places. And I hope in the rescue community, we're broadening our perspective to say, if I can get these animals into homes, I can help this shelter. I can take these transports. I can do whatever I need to do to kind of keep this full community going and making sure that we're saving lives wherever they are at risk, even if it's not within my own organization. I will say too, sometimes I, um, you know, people don't always make the assumption that if people have weird things on their um, adoption contracts that it's bad. I, and I think a good example is I did this workshop and there was a group in Los Angeles that is a blind dog group. I didn't know that at the time. And I said, you know, one of the things I thought I was so smart and I said, well, why, do, why can't you adopt to somebody with a swimming pool? And they're like, well, we have it in there. We certainly can rewrite that question. We do adopt to somebody, but Mark, we have blind dogs. Like we need to know if they have a, you know, they have a swimming pool to be able to equate that. So all I really needed to help them do was kind of re rewrite the question because it was phrased in a way that if you have a swimming pool, you're not going to get this animal, but that's a pretty darn good reason to have that on your application or at least talk to them about it on a checklist. Um, if that is kind of, you know, the type of animal that you're working with. And I think all in all, then this may feel counterintuitive, but um, strict requirements don't always mean um, good process. And I think that's the thing that we, I, I want to hit home with everybody. We want to do the right thing. And I promise we're going to get to some of those kind of tips in a second, but the stricter or the longer your adoption um, application is, does not mean that you're doing a better job and being, being, um, keeping your animals more safe. Um, it's, it's often what it does actually, it's, it turns more people off than not, you know, it gives a bad perception of who you are as a rescue. And a lot of times to me, um, I think it's a little bit lazy. Like we have to engage people a little bit more. Everybody is an individual. So you can't throw up a six page document before you want to even email somebody back or talk to them. And that's often what it's used for. It's almost like a triage, you know, and say, well, if they can get through this, they may be worthy to have my animal. And the fact of the matter is, is the animals that are in your care or animals that need you to rescue them or a shelter um, where they actually may be at risk it's potentially a very bad thing for them. So um, it often turns them into somebody that, uh, you know, our adopters or people that are trying to adopt, um, maybe into one, some of your worst critics. And we'll get into what kind of that means in a second. So that's where it's kind of how you guys are approaching, how you all are approaching your adoption philosophies and how you're kind of getting information. There's nothing wrong with adoption surveys, but if you do adoption surveys, they should be really pinpointed to the most important things. And, and to me, that's what is, you know, what's the expectation that you have? Do you want a dog? Do you want a cat? Um, do you want it to be like all over you? Are you looking for a dog that, yeah, you can cuddle, but has more independence, just like kind of varying, you know, basic things. Um, and then maybe some experience level with the animal. Um, if somebody, and it's really, so then your next step is you can kind of set expectations and help them guide um, them into either adopting that pet, not adopting that pet, or maybe finding other pets that are a little bit more, um, you know, meeting more of their expectations of what they're looking for. Just like us, they're nothing different. We often go with the thing that catches our eye the most, whether it's who we try to date, what dog or cat we want, we go to the pretty thing. Um, but sometimes the pretty thing isn't always the best match. And that's kind of our job sometimes if somebody has their eye on a certain animal or just setting their expectations. Because just because somebody walks in and says, you know, my place is immaculate, I want a dog or a cat that's going to be easy, that's not going to be too dirty on my, my area, sometimes people fall in love and it's complete opposite of what they think and it's totally fine. Um, you know, but if somebody that said that to me wanted to adopt this four-month-old kitten, I know that I need to set some expectations with them. They are going to 
potentially, you know, um, want to, you know, scratch on your furniture. So let's help you with kind of understanding if that happens, um, those kind of things. But it doesn't always mean it's no, just because they walk in and tell you something that they want. You know, in a conversation, you can kind of feel them out because bonds are, are bonds. Like I have animals that, you know, I wouldn't have picked out if it was kind of a black and white screen test, but you fall in love with what you fall in love with. And even though some of them are challenging, um, it doesn't always mean that it's the right fit. So I think sometimes we get very particular about making sure that it's the exact right fit for every person. It's not as simple as that. It's, is there a bond there? Do they understand what we know about this animal? And, and are they able to basically fulfill the needs that we think they are? And by doing that, it's, it's really important that how you kind of approach that. So if any of you have taken personality tests in the past, this is kind of a good anomaly. Like when I took... Um, you know, the Myers-Briggs, I had to always check myself because I'm like, I know this is the answer that is most like me, but I think this answer is probably the better answer that makes me look better. And when you interrogate somebody, like giving them a questionnaire that is very kind of like, tell me about the history of your animals. I want to know everything that happened to them. Do you have a swimming pool? How tall is your yard? You know, do you have a yard? How tall is your fence? All of these kind of things. It's more of an interrogative um, kind of aspect. And a lot of people, it doesn't mean they're bad people, will start to fish for what they think is the right answer versus the real answer. So how you go about um, with open-ended questions, being friendly, show, you know, um, doing some basic things to really just kind of engage them, whether it's by email or whether it's in person or by phone, um, instead of just like, here, fill this out um, and we'll get back to you. That is kind of more of an interrogation. And it's not surprising at times that some of you will, will end up getting people that may not be telling you the whole truth because they're so worried that they're gonna get denied. They're not gonna tell you the right answer, those kind of things. And it's counterproductive to what we're trying to do. And I think the important thing to note, and this just gets into some basic client service, and that is a big obstacle in adoptions. Client service cannot be underestimated. How we treat people, um, even if we're telling them things that they don't want to hear goes a long way. We are, most of us are private entities. So we live or die by um, people's donations, people's goodwills to adopt, to want to, you know, engage with us, to foster with us, any of those kind of things. And I think it's important to note, even though we think everybody is very negative, I know I certainly do like people reading Yelp reviews and those kind of things. You still, most people, if you really think about it, you know, and in different times when we were all out, maybe about more, most of the interactions when you went to the gas station, when you went to the coffee place, you know, many, you have many, many negative reactions and it doesn't always equate to you kind of, I need to see your manager and complain, or I'm going to go on Yelp and complain. So 96% of negative um, reactions, people usually don't complain, but the thing that they will do is they'll tell other people. And oftentimes uh, word of mouth, and especially for us, we are generally anointed animal experts to our family and friends because we're in this field. So if we have a negative thing to say about a certain shelter or a rescue, it's going to mean a lot to those people. And it doesn't mean that we necessarily put it on Yelp. Um, so it's really important to understand sometimes we can't give people what they want, but we can kind of control the negative and positive. And, and you can kind of see on the other end, positive, it's good. 95% of people will do additional business with you. It might not be right away. We're in the animal business. People aren't adopting animals every week, but they may engage you in events. They may start to volunteer and foster for you. Um, when they are looking for another animal, they usually will look to you first. And I think the thing that's really interesting, and I know this is more of a digital age, but I say, I mean, I think a lot of this translate into emails and, and, and definitely um, uh, phone calls as well. But I think it's important to note when you are, especially in an interaction, whether it's on um, Zoom or anything else, um, to really notate that actually what we say has so much less of an impact on our communication than our body language and our tone. Um, like my story before, I also tend to be a very loud person. So I'll go to certain areas and, and I'm very amplified and I'm very excited. Um, it can give off a different um, viewpoint of what I'm trying to say. That's more of people's focus than actually what I'm saying. Um, and the body language too. And I think so a good example of this, you know, we all can think about it an example in your head, but you know, 20 years ago, I'm at, you know, opening up presents for the holidays and I get a pair of socks and I say, thanks. This is great. And it's, it's exactly like, what do you actually believe? 
I'm not making eye contact, my head's down, my body language and my tone of voice is super depressed. I'm saying nothing that's wrong, but what will you actually really more communicate just like our animal brethren, so much more that we learn or that we pick up from people are, are kind of their body language, tone of voice. Um, you know, obviously when you're talking about email, what you say is a lot more important, <laughs> but still, um, if you're on a phone, like, I don't know if you've all have to work telemarketing jobs, but they always used to stress to me, at least in my job, they're like smile. It, 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 it affects how you talk to people, even on phone, even though they don't see you. I remember that being a big kind of portion of something that they would, um, you know, kind of hammer home with us. And I think the thing that's also important is when we are doing adoptions, so you want to tell them so much and you want to get so much information. So I'm not talking about getting information from them. I'm talking about what your information you're getting. So you've done your counseling, you've talked to them. And then there's this like, well, they have to sign their agreement. They need to know that if they need to give up their animal, it needs to come back to us. Um, you know, we want to give them these resources. So there's all of these kind of things that we're talking about. So this piece of paper basically represents your entire message, right? So these are all the things that you're trying to say. So a visualization of that. And the one thing, and this goes for emails as well, you all. So succinctness is very important, especially with people that are coming to you. They're not animal experts. They don't speak in the same acronyms as us. Many of them don't understand what intake means, those kind of things, right? So first off, you need to be very careful about the words you use and try to make them very layman for people so they can understand what you're talking about. Secondly, succinctness is kind of a really big thing. So if you're sending this whole kind of message when you're trying to adopt, they're only going to actually hear your voice half the time. So your message already is cut in half. They're going to then only listen. So they're actually listening to what they're hearing another half percent of your message. And then they're going to retain 12%. So it's really important that when you're trying to give information, when you're giving people um, talks about an animal, um, what they need to do when they get home, that you're really succinct in what this is, what this is gonna you know, take in. So if you're getting into long stories about you know, my pet from 2006 or those kind of things, you don't want that to be what this is. You want to be like, hey, um, this is your first time with a, with a cat. So I need to talk to you about, you know, litter box training. Um, I need to talk to you about feeding requirements, those kind of things. You know, those are the kind of things that you need to be careful with. It's really easy, especially for people like me to walk around the block two times, so to speak, to cross the street. You need to, you need to speed it up. You need to be, be succinct and really be direct with what you're trying to communicate. People do this actually worse I found in emails. They tend to want to throw a massive amount of information in emails. So if you're sending an adoption email, say, that's giving them all the information that they need to follow up with, it really should have links, very basic coverings, and make sure that it's hitting the most important points of what you're talking about rather than a very lengthy email because people just don't retain it. They don't listen to it. They don't read it. Um, they're only picking out things and their eyes kind of blaze. I think these are kind of really big things that are not surprising. You know, a lot of people reach out to us and they don't get responses. Um, so initial contact, they reach out to us, whether it's through social media, through our websites, or even um, calling us uh, at some of our centers and, you know, taking a long time to get back, to get through the process, especially for those of us in the rescue world. This is a big challenge for us. Um, and a lot of people, again, they expect to have their time um, treated with respect. They're, they're very, um, you know, if they're not getting what they need from us, they're moving on. Um, and I think that's something that you see. And that's the problem sometimes with some of these um, areas that like pet stores or online sales, call me up, meet me at this time, I'm going to give you your animal. It's hard to compete with. I'm not saying that we should be doing that, but we have to be a little bit more cognizant of how we kind of set our processes together to be a little bit more responsive um, because those are huge barriers for these folks and, and why they went from adopting to purchasing. So some things that you can do to help with that. So have information readily available ahead of time. So um, if you have a usual spiel about your animal, your group or whatever that you want people to consider, have it on your social media channels, have it on your website, have it on some of that kind of stuff. Because again, most people are starting to filter through populations. They want to read about the rescue. A lot of times that's a really good way to kind of get some of the stuff out there. Um, if you're requiring things, right? Like 
hey, if you're going to adopt from us, I need a copy of your driver's license, especially those of us that are doing events. Um, you know, most of us travel with, an, with a license, but if some groups want, you know, uh, landlords uh, information, I don't know that I would ever um, say that you should do that. But for those of you that do that, like you shouldn't spring it on at the time of adoption. Cause I don't know about you, but I don't carry my lease around with me, um, you know, or my insurance company contacts or any of those kind of things. Um, being responsive is pretty self-explanatory. Like we have to figure out whether it's use of other volunteers, um, other people to, to try to respond to emails and people and inquiries. It can be overwhelming. Um, but that is one of the things that, that causes a lot of people to, ch to choose to go and purchase animals. Um, Post adoption instructions are something that's really good too. If you have a website, you know, if you have links on behavior, you know, behavior um, resources, vet, low cost vet clinics, or those kind of things that you want, have that stuff available on your website. And that's something that even in a follow up email that you can have. But all of those kind of extra things that you want to make sure is out there, just make sure it's available for people if they go. Um, again, to your website, social channels, any of that kind of stuff. And what your fees are is important. So make sure that, you know, because that can be a surprise. You don't want to get to an end of a conversation. And for some reason, you know, hey, it's $250. Um, oh, and, and all of that time is not spent. But again, I would, I would implore you to think about fees, what these animals are, you know, what you're trying to get to and how much you may be able to equate and get away from always having high fees for every adopted animal because it is a big barrier. And oftentimes, um, especially in, in certain areas, like, you know, people can get animals for free um, or they'll go to somebody else where they can just make the purchase. The thing with purchasers that's, that's crazy is a lot of times those animals are crazy expensive. And those people, even if they're struggling or finding ways to purchase animals, and a lot of times it's because they're, they'll do it because it's just easier. They don't feel judged. They don't have to go through long processes. They don't have to wait for somebody to get back to them. And those are all things that we have to be um, a lot more cognizant on. So starting back again with adoption surveys. Our adoption surveys at Best Friends are one page. And like I told you, they're really basic. Um, what are you looking for? A cat, a dog, a bird? You know, what are you looking for? So first off, that's probably pretty important to help us. Um, would you rate, what, how would you rate your experience level with this animal? And I totally understand that sometimes people don't self-select accurately, but it just gives us a starting point because we're a conversational piece, whether it's through the phone or whether it's in person, you know, and, and it's just really important to make it fun. This is a really cool thing. You guys provide family members for people if you're in this field. Like that is a really cool thing and it should be fun. It can be, you know, stressful. There's responsibility on us. It can be even tedious at times, but it's, it's one of the funnest things that somebody who is actually looking to adopt an animal. I mean, it's a, it's a huge thing and it's really great. Um, just know too, when people are at, a, when they're at ease, when they feel like they're not being judged, when they're comfortable, they're going to give you more information um, and exactly kind of what you're looking for. So instead of having a three page or two page thing that they need to fill out, get kind of the basics. I use checklists. So I put the onus on our staff or our volunteers to say, Hey, if we all want to make sure that we're doing a good job and that we're asking about this, 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 and this, you know, we have a checklist that kind of train um, our adoption uh, volunteers and our adoption staff, you know, after they do a few of them, they know the checklist by heart, but we fill that out, but it's not something that we make the adopters do because we just want to make sure that we're, we're doing our due diligence in the conversation piece. And there's not, you know, a paper requirement by them that they're checking off. That's what the adoption contract is about. But again, open-ended questions, which means not yes or no, um, you're getting more information and a really good time with adoption surveys and to kind of get them in, especially for those of us, if you're at an event or you have an adoption center or you're at a shelter is it's really good to get information from people and talk about their experience level, their animals that they've had before when they're actually meeting the pet. They don't have to think about that stuff. They know it. So it's a really good uh, way to kind of engage in conversation while you're also getting the, the you know, kind of introduction kind of going with the people and the pet. And all I would say this, like, again, it's not a one size fit all, but look at your adoption questions, especially on your surveys. And what are you using that information for? Is it about that one time this really bad thing happened that I don't ever want to happen again? So now it's equating to all of your animals. Are there questions on there that this other rescue had on their uh, adoption contract that we just decided to put on ours, but we really don't use any of that kind of stuff? Get rid of it. 
because it, it, you know, again, what are the basic things that you need to start an adoption conversation with a person, whether it's, you know, by email or not. Um, and just make them align with, with who you are, you know, make sure our philosophy, we don't say yes to everybody at best friends, but we do not actively look to say no. We are trying to find a way or find a pet to help this person rescue an animal, do the right thing, and then have a support system of best friends or one of our rescue or shelter partners for them to be able to rely on throughout the life of that pet. So we are looking for ways to make this work. Again, we want to make sure animals are going to be safe. They're going to be fed. They're going to be, you know, taken care of. But, you know, beyond that, most of our animals don't care how big your house square footage is. They don't care about, you know, how nice your dishes are, you know, how nice our clothes are. Like, that's the thing that's lovely about them. They just want bond and love. Um, that's why you see some of the happiest animals living in with homeless people. <laughs> they're with their people all the time. They get it. It's, it's hard times. They're eating, they're feeding. So it's, it's, they're just much more simple. Uh, simple and pure beings. They really just want love, care, attention, and to be a part of someone's life. They want to be companions. And I think with um, this and the judgment, just, you know, being careful about being too judgy. And that's, again, we've kind of talked about this implicit bias. Um, you know, somebody might say the wrong term. Somebody might say, hey, I'm coming in. I want to get a guard dog. That can set some of us off, right? Oh, my, you know, we have to understand people don't understand all the lingo sometimes, or I don't want an aggressive dog. Well, dogs aren't really, you know, be careful. These are not people from our field and we have to, how we kind of judge them or, or kind of their our reaction sometimes to things that could be triggering can automatically set up a wall where people don't, you know, um, are shutting down and they're not really kind of engaging with us in the way that we want. Absolutes are something else that I would say is foundational to, to being weary of. This is a, or, uh, an organization that does amazing work, but it doesn't matter what each, each individual loss of OPSA is. If you have a child under eight years old in your family, you can't get one. And in the, in the small time where they may make an exception, they have to do a board vote on it. Um, so again, that's a lengthy process. You know, this happens a lot. No kids under 13. Um, can't be with other animals, I think is another big one. I, you know, 75% of the animals at Vintage Pet Rescue, we were originally told can't be with other animals. We are a cage-free rescue. Um, so sometimes it's just like us. There's some people that we can get along with. There's some people that we can't get along with. Animals are individuals. Absolutes are going to break down the amount of people that can actually get your animals. So you just want to be careful about that. Five points of counseling are kind of like the little paper thing that I talked about. If you're counseling somebody, you're basically, you got the information, try to pick the five most important things initially, at least verbally to talk to them about. You can send them on with packets. You can send them on with links and emails, all of that kind of stuff. But if there's things that you want to make sure to make you feel uh, that you've done a good job or your team has done a good job, try to reduce it down because it's, it can be overwhelming if you give them too much information and they don't retain anything. Um, don't compete with cute. This is a big one. If you want people to listen to you, don't bring a little fluffy animal um, up because they're not going to pay attention to you. Again, it's a good time where you can get information from them. But if you're actually counseling somebody, you want to talk, even if it's on Zoom, if I have a little dog right here, most of the attention is going to be here and not here. So just something to kind of keep in mind and in, in kind of how you um, adjust to um you know, kind of how you, how you kind of um, strategize your kind of talks. I'm sorry, I, I went the wrong way here. Um, and here's another thing, big, easy, something's really easy to do. And you can easily do this. It, it equates to whether you're on the phone or in person. If you want to send something over the top, it's really simple. If you do this guts thing, um, you're automatically right away going to amplify your ability to be uh, a step above most of us in animal welfare. Greeting. Greeting is simply, sometimes if you're in person, it can be just making eye contact, smiling at somebody. Obviously, there's more traditional things. Hey, hello. And in emails, a greet is always good as well. Hey, thank you so much for, you know, communicating with us, those kind of things. Using names. Um, so if you can, you know, a lot of that, uh, I'll tell my team is always tell them what your name is, whether we're on the phone, you obviously have it usually in a signature and an email, but I would still say in an email, tell them who your name is. Use their names if you're talking to them. If you can, if you're better than I am with names and can remember them, then you're really kind of blowing people away. Always thank them. 
You know, if they're reaching out to you, they're inquiring, they're asking questions, if you thank them and smiling, really simple stuff. But these are kind of really kind of foundational tenets to basic interactions around adoptions that are going to perpetuate positive vibes where people are going to feel um, a little bit more inclined to um, open up trust and have a good experience with your rescue or shelter. And lastly, um, there's a lot of really cool stuff. Again, um, we are in a different age and we need to trend, you know, we need to think about adoptions, not always. I mean, you still have an important aspect of people are going to have to meet these animals in person at some point. And hopefully you can do that, not just in an adoption center or in a, you know, um, at an event, but through a foster home um, and in virtual experiences as well. Um, I would recommend, there's a lot of technology out there, but we use Airtable a lot. And Airtable is something that really helps us organize not just our adopters, but our fosters as well to be able to be a little bit more responsive. Uh, because especially at the sanctuary, we get a ton of uh, requests all the time. Um, getting information back to some of our foster parents, you know, uh, those kind of things. So Virtual adoptions are kind of the future. And I think my impression of what, what's gonna be and hopefully is the best way to move forward is, I still think you're gonna need um, areas of time where people can go in and meet animals, just like we did before the pandemic. But to think that you know we can't also use virtual adoptions in the way that we had to for a large part in 2020, you're crazy. And if you have an organization that's not doing some of this stuff more virtually, I would advise you to kind of think about it because it's an easy way for people to have an interaction with an animal. It's easier for fosters. They don't have to set up a time and go meet somebody somewhere, bring them to their home. There's a lot that can be done here. And there's a lot of technology that helps make it easier um, for you to actually organize it. Cause I know like Vintage Pet Rescue, we have no staff, it's all volunteer. So having a way to um, organize our ability with our fosters and those kind of things are really important. And I think for a lot of rescues, it's, it's those kind of things too. And you have some really basic, easy, you don't have to be a tech head, you know, to understand this stuff, but um, I would continue and think about how you can virtually um, access some of the public. Um, and especially if you're putting up animals more and more things like videos, um, you know, even um, virtual bios, um, those kind of things are really important. And there's a lot of things that you can read about open adoptions to get more into it. Um, but this is kind of just kind of scratching the surface really on um, getting to the foundational uh, proponents of this. But if you wanna read more about open adoptions, about cost of animals and adoptions, those kind of things, um, all of that stuff is in here for you all to kind of uh, take a look at. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, we, um... There was a question in the chat from Gail. It says, how do you respond to people who want to have their cat declawed? I know in British Columbia, it's a non-issue because vets are not allowed to declaw a cat. So yep. I'm not sure um, if you have anything you want to add to that. What we generally do, um, well, first and foremost, if we have, we, you know, most places and more and more places in the U.S., the same thing is happening. A lot of places are banning, declining, but there are still big sections of the United States that have vets that are actually declining animals. And it's really hard for the public to understand if a vet is saying it's okay and doing it, you know, so that would be a thing that I would be, one, key into just being understanding, um, because I know it's terrible. You're cutting off their, you know, fingertips. Um, but what we would generally do in most shelters is... Um, if we have already declawed animals, we would show them them, uh, cats, we would start there. We would have, you know, I had a boss, I'm not kidding, that used to, as soon as somebody, as soon as she heard the word declawed, she would pull out pictures of declaws going wrong. Not what I recommend at all. But I think, you know, what I would say is kind of have a conversation, have them understand what that is. You know, some vets are doing this for us, you know, none of us, are, you know, that I know of are going to be like, yeah, no problem, declaw, you know, have at it. But um, if you can find an animal that's already declawed, no problem. If you can talk them out of it, and here's the key, are they going to be able to convince you that they're not going to declaw their animal? And that's where I can be with. If you can give them the information, you can read them. If they say, gosh, I didn't know that, like, of course, I wouldn't do that anymore. You obviously need, if they're declawing, they're worrying about their furniture being ruined or their kids maybe being scratched. So also kind of getting into some of that stuff. But we would not, if somebody said, I don't care, and we're going to declaw, to be honest, we would say we would not be able to adopt, you know, a cat to you unless it's already declawed. Um, but there are going to be other organizations potentially that would, but not many, um, 
so that's kind of how we would field it. But hopefully there's maybe a declawed animal potentially to, to show them. Right. Yeah. And, and like you said, you know, sometimes as being as opened as we want to be, there are still some times where people get turned away. It's mm -hmm. that's, that's going, that's definitely going to happen. Um, does anyone have any other questions for Mark before we close the session? The, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is being recorded. So I will send uh, the recording to everyone um, uh, within the, by the end of the week. Um, so you can share this with your colleagues. Uh, Mark has put his email, uh, Mark with a C, P at bestfriends.org. Um, uh, if you guys want to follow up with any questions after the presentation, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer. Uh, okay, so um, Rob says, great seeing you again, as always, picking up what you're putting down. And he's, he's, he's in Philly, so 4 p.m., so he's, he's left. So thanks very much, Rob. And Ryan, are you able to share the clerk checklist for when speaking with potential adopters? Yeah, Ryan, can you do me a favor and just drop me an email um, and ask me for that? Mark P at bestfriends.org. Hopefully you can see it sort of at the end and I would be happy to share um, some templates with you. Great, awesome. Great, well, thank you again, Mark. And thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon and uh, enjoy the rest of the week. You as well, Kathy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.